<clears throat> Mr. President. Minority Leader. I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. A week ago, the Senate lost a distinguished former colleague, and the state of Nevada lost an unparalleled advocate. Senator Harry Reid's path to this chamber was a quintessentially American story. His incredible path from childhood poverty to the boxing ring to leading the U.S. Senate took both toughness and tenacity. And in this chamber, just like everywhere else, Harry left it all in the ring. As leaders of our respective parties, the two of us disagreed energetically and often. We had sharply different views, goals, and philosophies on everything from public policy to the institution of the Senate itself. But through all the heat and light, I never doubted that Harry was doing what he earnestly believed was right for Nevada and for the nation. And Elaine and I were grateful to enjoy a joint friendship with Harry and Landra, the light of Harry's life, his beloved high school sweetheart. The Senate's thoughts and prayers continue to be with her and the entire Reed family. Now on a completely different matter, as the Senate begins this new year and new session, Millions of Americans are yet again having life disrupted by a new and surging variant of the coronavirus. Thus far, there is cause for optimism. The rapidly spreading Omicron variant seems to cause milder disease than previous iterations. By now, a huge portion of our population has some immunity through our remarkable safe and effective vaccines or through prior exposure. And our healthcare providers know much more today than they did two years ago. Unfortunately, the last few weeks have also exposed big gaps between the Biden administration's promises and the reality under their leadership. In 2020, then candidate Biden promised he would shut down the virus. That clearly has not happened. Back when the virus had killed 220,000 Americans, then-candidate Biden said anyone who's responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States. <clears throat> now, almost four times that many people have died. Now, look, no, nobody's solely blaming this administration for this mutating virus. But nobody forced Democrats to campaign on those promises and attacks they chose to do that, but they haven't governed accordingly. It's been nearly a year since President Biden inherited three vaccines and a distribution operation that was already putting a million shots in a million arms every day. That was before this administration took office. What new solutions do Democrats have to show for a full year in power? Where is their 2021 equ equivalent? to our 2020's Operation Warp Speed. What did they produce in 11 months besides angry speeches about the vaccines they inherited? Why does the pandemic in January 2022 feel so eerily similar to the pandemic in January of 2021? Except that this administration happened to get lucky with an apparently less dangerous variant. After a year of this administration, families are still having trouble tracking down testing for work, school, travel, or even peace of mind. This administration has limited important treatments. They've dragged their heels on promising innovations. They've been inexplicably slow to disperse relief funds for hospitals and providers that Congress set aside ages ago. They've used odd, alienating rhetoric around the vaccines they inherited. 
And remember last spring when our Democratic colleagues spent $1.9 trillion on a supposedly COVID-related spending bill, only 9% of it went to the actual fight against COVID. Just 9% of the $1.9 trillion authorized last March. So this all Democratic government spent its first year distracted and the country is feeling the consequences. Now on a related matter, fortunately for the country, before Christmas, one of those far left distractions was dealt a setback. The Democrats' wasteful spending last spring helped ignite the worst inflation in 40 years, but our colleagues spent the rest of 2021 trying to assemble yet another, even bigger, even more reckless and taxing spending spree. Their reaction to rising prices and family hardships, their policies caused, was to try to inflate their way out of inflation. The experts say that when you strip away the budget gimmick, their proposal would cost almost $5 trillion. And all of that reckless borrowing and money printing was for far left policies that would hurt American families and actually help China. The supposedly green subsidies would just dump money into China dominated supply chain. Americans, America takes on massive debt to build back Beijing. The childcare plan was actually an unworkable and discriminatory toddler takeover that would drive up daycare costs and let woke bureaucrats drive out faith-based providers. They even wanted to distort American parents' child tax credit and turn it into an old school cash welfare program with no work requirements at all. <clears throat> now all of this paired with historic crushing tax hikes and trillion more dollars to make inflation even worse. It was a merrier Christmas for American families because this awful bill was actually put aside. Working Americans needed to actually stay on the shelf. Now, on one final matter, <clears throat> when our colleagues' reckless taxing and spending spree began to falter, some Democrats started saying a totally different issue was actually really their top priority. If they don't get to blow $5 trillion on low quality socialism, our colleagues are now demanding a consolation prize, breaking the Senate's rules in order to give themselves sweeping control over all 50 states' election laws. This is what some of our colleagues want so desperately. This is what they've sought for years. Even as their pretexts and justifications kept shifting, the goal stayed consistent. Most Washington Democrats want to appoint themselves a nationwide board of elections on steroids, and they want to shatter the Senate's rules and traditions to make it happen. After Democrats lost the White House in 2016, they said this takeover was necessary because our democracy was fundamentally broken. Now that they've won the White House, this story has totally flipped. Now our democracy is in perfect shape beyond reproach except when states that Democrats don't control dare to pass mainstream voting laws. The political left keeps pitching their big lie that mainstream state voting laws are somehow Jim Crow 2.0, if the governor who signs the bill happens to be a Republican. The left's big lie insults the intelligence of the American people. All the facts disprove it. In one of the states that triggered this meltdown, the new proposals mandated more days, more days of early voting than many Democrat-run states provide today. Our democracy is not in crisis. Repeating this rhetoric doesn't make it factual. The 2020 election saw the highest turnout in more than 100 years. Only 33% of American adults think it's too hard for eligible voters to vote. A larger share actually think current rules aren't strict enough. This is fake, fake hysteria, ginned up by partisans, and our citizens actually know it. They figured it out. Last November, even in New York, the state's overwhelmingly Democratic voters rejected 
several left-wing ballot measures to change voting laws. This big lie that democracy is dying because Democrats sometimes lose elections is a completely astroturfed sense of crisis. The emperor has no clothes. It's even more ironic that on this most sensitive subject, our democracy itself, some Senate Democrats want to drop a procedural nuclear bomb on the Senate itself to get their way. Our colleagues have no principled opposition to the filibuster, none at all. This is not about principle. In 2020 alone, Senate Democrats used the filibuster to repeatedly block the CARES Act, delaying help at the start of the pandemic. They used it to kill Senator Tim Scott's police reform bill. In 2017, 32 Senate Democrats, including then Senator Harris, signed an open letter insisting the legislative filibuster should not change. And a few years before that, the current Democratic leader said this about the prospect of nuking the filibuster. This is the current Democratic leader, quote, the ideologues in the Senate want to turn what the Founding Fathers called the cooling saucer of democracy into the rubber stamp of dictatorship. He went on. They believe if you get 51% of the vote, there should be one party rule. He went on. They want to make this country into a banana republic, where if you don't get your way, you change the rules. He went on. It'll be a doomsday for democracy if we do. That's the Senate Democratic leader on the possibility of nuking the Senate. Some people's tunes change when they happen to be in the majority versus the minority. But some Senators mean what they say. There are senators on both sides of the aisle who've had the courage to stand up for these important rules when we've been in the minority and when we've been in the majority. I don't have to remind the Senate that the previous president frequently harangued me to nuke the Senate. On every occasion, I had a one-word answer. No. No. There's senators on both sides who understand that any supposed limited carve-out would bring the whole House crashing down. There's senators on both sides who understand that the entirety of federal law shouldn't go radically boomeranging back and forth every time the Senate narrowly changes hands. Clerk will call the roll.